You know, as human beings, we love to make comparisons. Almost all of our purchases are based on comparisons, right? If you buy a Ford, it's probably because you enjoy smooth handling. Um, you might buy Chrysler because you say, I really like the design. Or you buy Chevy because you believe GM makes the best motor. But whatever the reason, you probably buy things based on comparing what you purchase against other things in the market. Same can be said for our clothing or our appliances or food. Every purchase we make, we are comparing products against each other. And we all base it on different things, right? Could be style, could be value, could be quality, could be price, but we always compare. The problem with making comparisons is we can take it too far. We have a tendency to determine the value of even ourselves and we'll compare ourselves against somebody else, either of the same gender, same economic status, same job. How many times have I thought so-and-so is better than me because, or I'm better than he or she because? You know, I, I was thinking about this during the week and I began to realize there isn't one thing in my life, there isn't one category in my life that I think I do the best. Better than anyone else in the world? I would think that there's always somebody who's better than me. I mean, even, even you. There, some of you are better disciplined at exercise than me. Many of you eat better than me. Some of you can sing better than me. I could name a hundred pastors who are better preachers than me. And nowadays, the internet puts excellence right into the palm of my hand. At any moment, I can view the world's best. I mean, Friday, July 26 is the start of the Summer Olympic Games. But the thing about the Olympics is it proves that only a very small percentage of the population is the very best at anything. This past May, I turned 56, and I think I am past my energetic youth, <laughs> and I'm residing that uh, ordinary <laughs> is as good as I'm ever going to get. This morning, we're going to read the story of two brothers and a story of sibling rivalry and comparison. And it goes all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4. It says, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You know, when we think of this story, Cain and Abel, we sometimes picture a scene like this. Two men, right, two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain's a farmer, Abel's a shepherd. Cain goes out to harvest some of his crops and he gives them to God. Abel goes out to his flocks. He picks out an animal and he gives it to God. God looks at both offerings, right? Compares them. Cain's on the left, Abel's on the right. And considering them both, God chooses one over the other. How do we picture that decision happening? Is God sitting down at a restaurant and he's looking over the menu and he casually says to the waiter, you know, I'm, I'm not really feeling like Brussels sprouts and spinach today, I think I'll have the lamb chops. No. First of all, it's not a competition. Each offering is made independently of the other. In verse 3, we're told that Cain brought an offering from the fruit of the ground. In verse 4, we are told that Abel also makes an offering from the firstborn of his flock. Nowhere are we told that these offerings are made together. We are simply told that each one 
makes an offering to God. Also, it would not be very just for God to pit two offerings against each other. We would have considered the offerings alone. Each one should stand on its own merit. And I would think that's what God would do. His conclusion in verse 4 and 5 says, The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. And I think this is important. God did not reject Cain's offering because Abel's was better. And he did not accept Abel's Uh, He did not accept Abel's because Cain was inferior. God is God. He can do whatever he wants. Could have accepted both offerings, could have rejected both offerings. So why does God accept one over the other? Have you ever wondered that? Let's see if we can look at these offerings from God's perspective. Maybe we can make some conclusions. Conclusions that might help us when we offer our sacrifices to God. First, let's look at Cain's offering and just consider, well, who is Cain? Cain is the firstborn son of Adam and Eve. This is significant because of the promise that God gives to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. God is promising a deliverer in this moment. One who would crush the head of the deceiver. And we know today that this passage is referring to Jesus Christ. And as Bible scholars have read this passage, they have dubbed it the proto, meaning first, evangelion, gospel. So this is the first mention of the gospel. But of course, at the time, Adam and Eve don't know that. God's promised a deliverer. So when the firstborn son is born, they name him Cain. But the meaning of the name is very significant because the Hebrew word for Cain literally means received. Cain was given to them by God. He was a gift. And his name literally reminds them of blessing. But by the time their second born comes around, they call him Abel. Abel has a very different meaning. Abel means emptiness. Talk about a comparison. The firstborn child, Eve says, I have a gift from God. I have received this. The secondborn comes around and Eve says, I have nothing from God. This is empty. I wonder what happened in their lives between the first child and the second. Why? Name the second child. Such a, such a harsh name. Cain grows up and becomes a farmer. He goes out into the fields. One day, harvests some of his crops. And as he's, he's gathering his crops, he decides, I'm going to put together an offering. He grabs some of his wheat, his corn, his alfalfa. He combines it all together as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Lord considers it. The Lord considers Cain and says, it's unacceptable. Why? Why wasn't Cain's offering acceptable to God? Now, some people have suggested that, well, it's because it wasn't an animal sacrifice. The sacrifice didn't contain blood. They believe that for the offering to be acceptable, it would have had to have been an animal. But I don't think so, because we can see in Leviticus that grain offerings were perfectly acceptable. And even by the time of Jesus, we know the Pharisees were tithing their spices. Cain was a farmer, so giving grain would be a natural, acceptable thing for him to do. So it can't be the content of the offering that God rejects. So that only leaves the person. Notice that we're told, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So it wasn't just that God rejected the offering, but Cain. Look at 1 John 3. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil, 
and his brothers righteous. John doesn't even mention an offering. The passage just says, you know, this guy, his deeds were evil. The best way that I can explain it is that Cain had a problem here. Cain had a problem in his heart. So perhaps Cain's sacrifice was more of an attempt to appease God than it was as an act of faith, it, as an act of worship. It reminds me of the child who doesn't get their own way. You know the scene, right? Dad's sitting in his chair, he's reading his newspaper, his son or daughter walks in and says, Dad, I love you. You're the, you're the best dad in the whole world. And dad's wise and he goes, uh-huh, yeah. What do you want? Nothing, dad, I just wanted to tell you, I love you and you're such a great dad. Okay, dad says. Oh, and dad, by the way, hey, do you think it'd be okay if I borrowed the car tonight? Now the father understands. No, I told you, you can't go out past 11 and your mom and I need the car tonight. So what happens? What does the son do? And he stomps out of the room. He forgets how much he loves his dad. That worship that he gave earlier, that was just to appease his dad and to get something that he wanted. There was no meaning attached to his words. That sounds like Cain. He comes to God with an offering. God sees his heart isn't in the right place and God doesn't accept it. Cain should have been repenting, felt remorse for his life, but instead he storms off angry, bitter, and jealous. I never get what I want. God loves Abel more than me. If I get rid of Abel, then there's gonna be no one around for God to compare me to. And then God will accept me. And his heart stays dark. His heart stays cold. His heart stays unresponsive to God's leading. It reminds me a little bit of even Christians that we see today. You know, a lot of people think that Christianity is something you do on Sunday. A person goes to church every Sunday and they hope that that sacrifice that they made will appease God. But then church is over and they go back to living their lives exactly the way they always did. We forget the lessons that we learn. We forget the generosity and the grace from God. And then we, in turn, for six days, sink deeper down into the world. And we go back to comparison and a life of pride. How much of my Monday to Saturday offends God? Do I remember to pray, to read the scriptures, to fill my mind with good thoughts? Am I slow to anger? Am I quick to forgive? Am I a person who loves my neighbor as myself? The offering plate that goes by that is not so that I can just throw something in and appease God for another week. Get him off my back. You know, I'm paying God to turn a blind eye. The bottom line, God doesn't want my grain offering or my blood offering. He wants me. Church, what takes place here on a Sunday morning that is not Christianity, that is worship. All of this, the entire hour is worship. And that is only one aspect of your faith. It's not all of it. That's where Cain fails. He believed that his worship would appease God and then the rest of his life wouldn't matter. And when he discovers that his worship isn't acceptable to God, he becomes angry. So let's look at Abel. And his offering. See why it's different. Why does God accept Abel's offering? We can go to Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God, testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. This wasn't an offering to appease God. He understood 
that he needed God's grace. He understood that he was at God's mercy. And so he makes a sacrifice that represents his heart that he follows the Lord. He, got, he does so with a broken and contrite heart. Abel sacrificed the firstborn of his flock, and by faith, he asks for God's grace and for, for forgiveness. In other words, his worship comes from the heart. Now I'll go back to Genesis chapter 4 with me, and I want you to notice something very important. Verse 4 says, God had regard for Abel and his offering. Verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. You see, God regarded the person over the offering. God had regard for Abel, but not for Cain. Why? Because of their heart, not because of the offering. God regarded the person over the offering. Understand, worship is a heart thing. Worship is a matter of the heart. Cain's form is fine. There's nothing wrong with a grain offering. The problem was a matter of the heart. He could make all the sacrifices that he wanted to, but until his heart was right, he was never going to have that relationship with God. I hate to say this, but there's millions of people all over the world this morning who are in church, and they are just like Cain. Their form is fine, but they are far from God. They may even say they believe in God, but they don't have a relationship with him. So what do they do? They attempt to appease God every Sunday with an offering. Time, I was there for another hour. Money, I gave you every dollar that was in my pocket. There are even leaders in churches and in their communities, people that teach Sunday school, people that work in the nursery, people that sing on stage. And as they do, they're hoping that their work will be acceptable to God. But the fact of the matter is, you don't need to appease God. God has already been appeased. His wrath has already been abated. Jesus Christ bought and paid for your salvation 2,000 years ago. So when it's my turn and the offering plate is coming towards me, Am I going to write a check to Living Water, or am I going to write a check to the building fund, or am I going to write a check to God's garage, hoping to appease God? Or am I doing this because I understand, and because I have a broken and contrite heart, because I want nothing more than to give, because I understand that God already owns it. God already owns it. Look at 2 Corinthians 8. Here you have a church uh, in Macedonia who's poor, very poor. And a lot of people can relate, you know, we can relate. Gas prices are going up, inflation's going up. A lot of people are having a hard time making ends meet. But this, this church in Macedonia, they didn't allow their poverty to restrict them from giving. And Paul notices it and he makes a point to brag on their church to the church in Corinth. He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in the severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. What makes a church that's in severe affliction still give a church whose heart has the proper perspective? God is already the owner of all things. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded upon it the seas and established it upon the rivers. I'm sure you've heard the expression, you can't take it with you. Right? That means one day, everything that you own will either belong to someone else, be in a secondhand store, or in a landfill. I do not own anything. Right now, I am just a manager. Psalm 50 tells us exactly who owns it all. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against you. I am God, your God. 
Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your fields. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. And if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Once we get that into our heads, then we are on our way to having a heart of worship. Everything belongs to God. And this is not just a Sunday morning attitude. The rest of the week, we should not allow ourselves to be distracted by material things of this world. Right? I need a bigger house. I need a, a, bigger, a better car to drive or more fashionable clothes to wear. I need to worry about my investments or worry about my retirement plans. Every moment, every moment of our lives, we are managers of God's property. Because the moment you stop breathing, all those things that you are thinking about will become irrelevant. They will not matter. Job, Job understood this. He was rich, Job was powerful, but he soon realized that it didn't matter. He says in Job 1.21, naked I came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return. So why give money if God doesn't need money? Well, because the church needs money. <laughs> the church needs money to operate. There is a staff that has to be paid. There's an electrical bill that has to be paid. There are missionaries that need to be supported. God's house is just like your house. The church needs money to keep things going. And God uses his people to meet the needs of the church and uses his people to meet the needs of others. He does this and then uses us as conduits, and then we end up receiving all the blessing. The second thing we should consider, if God owns it, then he loans it, right? He loans it. James says it very well when he says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Have you ever thought that to yourself? That, you know, when you're looking at your possessions or looking at your checking account and you're thinking to yourself, you know what? It's my money. It's my money. I, I'll spend it how I want. Don't tell me how to spend my money. It's my money. I'll spend it how I want. Okay. How do we usually spend it? <laughs> On ourselves, right? And listen, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with wanting to spend money on yourself. Okay? But when our priorities are higher than God's, when our priorities outweigh God's, and we, we live in castles and God lives in shambles, then there's a problem with our heart. Look at the book of Haggai. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you to yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while, the ha while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. What does that mean? What do, what do all those examples mean? Do those sound familiar to you? What does it mean that you sow much but harvest little? Well, if we were going to say that today, we would say, you know what? You've, you've made millions of dollars, but what do you have to show for it? What have you done with it? I mean, this, the Bible says you eat and drink but never have enough. What does that mean? It means... Wow, you sure go out to eat a lot. You sure spend a lot of money on fancy food and expensive bottles of wine. And you never seem to have enough. It never seems to satisfy. I mean, you clothe yourself, but you're never warm. You have lots of clothes in your closet, and you're constantly buying more. I mean, how many pairs of shoes do two feet need? You got your paycheck, and you store it in a bag of holes. 
meaning you spend your money as fast as you make it. And God says, meaning, meanwhile, my house lies in ruins. God loans it. What are we doing with it? Do we spend it on our will or his will? So part of being a good servant is giving back to God a portion of what he's given us. Remember, God doesn't need my money. He didn't need Cain's offering. He didn't need Abel's offering. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 6, for wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In the Old Testament, the tithe was brought into the storehouse. It's a physical place. The Jews would deliver their offerings of grain and animals, and it was used to feed the priests and to feed the widows and the orphans and to feed the Gentiles who were poor that lived among them in the Hebrew cities. And really, if you think about it, the same thing is done today. So that's what the church uses the tithe for today. And it takes, it takes finances to be able to do all those things. I could tell you a couple of uh, house cleaning items that we have. We need to swap out all the light bulbs that are in the FLC upstairs with new lights. So all the classrooms need new lights. The bathrooms, they all need new lights. We have to replace our projectors back there. They're getting really old and dim. And every Sunday I climb up and down a ladder to turn them on because the remotes no longer work. We have to fix our sanctuary lights. We've got problems with the electrical and we've got bulbs that burn out and die out. And down the road, you know, we would love to build a brand new building out there on that property. We'd love to put a brand new a uh, bigger FLC out there for weddings and for bigger potlucks. Malachi says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you do not have enough room for it. You know that passage at the very beginning? God offers you an invitation. He says, test me in this test me in this. You know, most of us were so hesitant to put anything in the offering plate. We're worried that God won't provide, that we need all of our resources. But God says, test me. You know, most of us would probably never think of going into a restaurant and eating a big meal and then not leaving the waitress anything less than 15%. We were just like, what? You you only left a buck, you, you, didn't, you didn't leave a 15% tip? And we would be ashamed if someone left less than 15%. And yet we find it so difficult to give God 10, right? When all of God's money is his. It's not a legal matter. It's not a matter of grain or blood. It's a heart matter. It's between you and God. I'm not here today to tell you to do anything. I would just ask that you seek the will of God, and when you give, you give with a heart of worship. Let's pray. Lord, it is our desire to come back to a heart of worship, because everything is about you. It's all about you. Every beast on a thousand hills is yours. Every bird in the sky is yours. And every dollar in every bank account is yours. The world and all that is in it. Lord, when we give, may we give with a heart of worship. May we give with only the desire to love and to say thank you. Help us not to give to pay you off or to buy our way out of another week. Help us not to give with remorse. Help us not to give out of fear. When we give, may we give because we love you and because we are grateful for each and every day. We are so blessed, Lord. So blessed to have this moment and every moment 
So blessed to be your children. So blessed to have the good graces of life and liberty each day. And we thank you. We praise you from the bottom of our heart. Amen. Hey, thanks for visiting us uh, these last three weeks and walking through both missions and compassion uh, with us. It's been uh, a good refresher to talk about these things. And uh, I know we don't talk about them very much. We don't talk about our missionaries very much, but uh, we are a local church. We are a community church. We are a non-denominational church, which means every dollar that's given to our church stays either here at this church or it goes directly to the missionaries that we support. We don't have a parent organization that governs us or tells us how to give. We don't have to pay a parent organization to watch over us and support us, which means as a local family, neighborhood, non-denominational church, every dollar that you give, there's complete transparency. You know exactly where it goes and uh, you get to vote and have a say on where it goes. And so we enjoy uh, our tithe is going to support local ministries, uh, both in Montgomery and Conroe. And uh, like we mentioned our first week, we do support uh, an international uh, water mission and a international um, foster mission. So um, we're, we are excited to be able to have those opportunities for us and excited to be a non-denominational community church for you. That means regardless of your faith practice, regardless of how you were raised, whether you were raised Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic, even Jewish, you are welcome here. You are welcome at this church to worship the living God. You are welcome to have communion. You are welcome to sing side by side with us. You are welcome. Regardless of how long you've been a Christian, regardless of uh, how you feel inside, whether you feel worthy or not worthy, regardless of how you feel as a sinner or at, that you've been walking with Christ your whole life. This church welcomes you with open arms. This is an open door. We are a welcoming church. We are a loving church. And we recognize that we are all sinners and that we all need God's grace. We have two services at 9.30 and 11. Our 11 o'clock service has a full program for children uh, from birth, from nursery, all the way through high school. And we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week.